how he did. I wanted my kids to be happy, and I made my promise to my kids when they were born that, that I was going to do two things, no matter what. I was going to love them, no matter what, and I was going to be the best mother I could be, no matter what. I didn't want them to be me, be like me, and I certainly didn't want them to be like me. I just wanted them to be, and to be happy. And my job was to support them and see them through that. Well, then Paris killed his little sister. And you know what? What the hell are you supposed to do with that as a mother? So I went back to my promise to love my child no matter what and to be the best mother that I could be no matter what. And all these issues cropped up with juvenile justice reform and victim advocacy and and I'm just keeping my promise to my kids. So still, ironically enough, even though it's been the biggest source of pain, my kids are still what keeps me going. I'm not sure how Bill helps. Sometimes I wonder if he is. <laughs> I am extremely grateful for my faith in God, and that's basically uh, being raised in a Christian family, knowing the principles of the Bible, and my personal faith in God is um, First of all, I want to uh, appreciate God in your life. Uh, I'm a bit emotional because when you are telling your stories, I sort of wanted to share, I mean, share some tears. That's why I said I uh, appreciate God for your life. Uh, to be able to have that kind of love, it takes some uh, grace. You know? The Bible says by this shall all men know that you are the sons of your heavenly Father. If you have love one for another, um, to be able to uh, ha have such an experience, and your uh, your parents, your daughter, or your son, I mean, it takes a, a very great mind to be able to absorb that. Now, my question is, uh, sir, uh, I don't know, do you uh, collaborate with other bodies to be able to uh, go ahead with this campaign? Because I believe that uh, uh, to, if you are able to collaborate with other, uh, maybe Christian bodies <coughs> or other, other bodies, I think uh, the, the, the campaign will be better uh, carried out. That's number one. Number two. Do you still have any other agenda for other parts of Africa? Because uh, Uganda and Kenya, they are into, uh, towards North uh, uh, Africa. Uh, do you have any agenda for maybe to the South or to the West or other parts of Africa? Well, I'm still shocked that we were able to go to Uganda, <laughs> Rwanda, and uh, Kenya. I have not unpacked my bags yet, but I'm ready to go back right now. Uh, I'm convinced that God's hand is in our trip to Africa. Uh, and I'm ready to go back. I want to go with the documentary crew because the things we saw there were just so amazing. Um, for instance, we went to death row, to the men's death row and the women's death row in Uganda. The Franciscan sisters have a real uh, impact on the, death, on, the, on the prison system in Uganda. They've been doing stuff for many years, helping with education. Um, and the guard, they were able to get us in the death row with absolutely no problems. The, the, the nuns went in with their purses, they wouldn't even, their purses wouldn't even scan, they trust them that much. They trust anybody that they bring with them. But we went in, uh, it was a religious service for death row inmates, it was about 220 men dressed in white, just raising their hands, praising God, beating the drums, they sang for about a half hour, just beautiful, wonderful places, full of hope, uh, full of faith, uh, and, and full of love. And uh, the guards were their friends. We went to the women's death row. Same thing, the women praising God. Uh, 34 of the women wore checkered dresses that showed that they were death row inmates, and it's about 100 of regular general population. They sang, we shared our stories, they shared some stories. The uh, assistant warden of the prison, uh, who was with us the whole time, uh, saw her giving hugs to death row inmates. Uh, when we finished our talk, she went there and said, Praise God. I mean, you don't see that sort of thing here in the United States. But the guards, they don't want to see none of those prisoners executed. They want to educate them. They want to rehabilitate them. A third world country like Uganda putting the art system to shame and how somebody like in Rwanda um, can come to the free
forgiveness and the reconciliation and uh, not have that desire for revenge. So I'm still in awe that we were there a few days ago and I cannot wait to go back again. And we also the uh, thing in uh, Rwanda we met uh, a lot of other people represented in different countries in Rwanda and throughout Africa. And I, I know we'll be going back again, but I have no idea what the agenda will be. That's still in God's hands. And I'm sorry, I forget the first question. Do you plan to go down south anywhere else? Do you plan to go anywhere else, he was asking. In this country? Yeah. No, no, I mean, do uh, you still have any other program for any other parts of Africa? For other parts of Africa? Um, I hope so. Basically, our philosophy with the Journey of Hope, and it's the pledge I made God almost 25 years ago, I'll go through any door that's open. And so any door that's open in Africa, I'll go. <coughs> Um, considering what your father testified to, what was, uh, has your father, what is your relationship like with your father? Has he had a transformation or? My father, uh, well, when, when it was headlines that I was going to Italy, uh, on Cooper's behalf, immediately journalists began to call my father. What do you think of your son? He said, be a travesty, he's trying to help her. So he said some things that weren't, uh, that I didn't really enjoy reading in the newspaper. But what I had learned about forgiveness um, made it real easy for me to forgive my dad for not understanding why I was doing what I was doing. Uh, but for several years it was very tense, but we had a reconciliation shortly before, and I didn't say this before, with Paul Cooper is off the death row today. Before the, shortly before she was taken off the death row, uh, there was reconciliation. And I tell people my father forgave me for forgiving Paul Cooper. Uh, but today, uh, he's still alive, he'll be 92 years old, uh, Friday. Uh, we have a wonderful relationship. Uh, we still don't see eye to eye on everything, uh, but those things we just don't talk about, but what we do talk about, it's a wonderful, wonderful relationship. Um, how would you to demonstrate your commitment to nonviolence as, as far as, how, how do you advocate peace in certain areas or just in what you do? Okay, personally, I have the philosophy that the answer is love and compassion for all humanity. And I try to live with that compassion and I try to share that with other people um, because I think that's really the secret. A lot of people, you know, they want revenge or whatever else, they want paybacks for things they did. Um, but I'm convinced the answer is love and compassion and I try to approach everything from that philosophy. Well, I'd like to say that I'm trying to live by a good example, but I do lose my patience quite a bit. But I remain peaceful while I do it. <laughs> 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 Most of the time, I mean, the best way that I know is just to show people. And, or I guess the first thought that crops into my mind is we like to assume that if we have this nice, peaceful utopia, then we can all sit back, kick back, relax, and be in heaven. And peace takes work. Like, peace is hard. It's, it's very easy to be angry and it's very easy to retaliate, but it's very hard to be peaceful and to be logical and to be humane. So work hard at it, I guess, is the best way to achieve peace. Keep working hard at it. I tell it, do it by sharing my story and building my foundation and, you know, just keep breathing. We don't sleep. You breathe it, eat and breathe it. <laughs> but it's hard, it takes work, so just work at it. If utopia is not easy, but it's somewhat attainable. Um, what happens with Paula and, um, like you said, did you ever communicate with her? Uh, yes, uh, the, the, after November 2nd, I immediately wrote her a letter. I don't know if she'd write back or not, but she did. Um, and so, we began correspondence. Uh, it was established we'd like to visit if the Department of Corrections in the state of Indiana would let us visit. Uh, but we did write letters about every 10 days we would exchange letters. Um, she was on, uh, I had an opportunity to go to Italy three times while she was uh, on death row. Her case kind of became a big case internationally because she was 15 years old when she was sentenced to death and there is no death penalty in Europe. And so the European people were especially interested in her case. And, uh, by the fall of 1989, over uh, almost 3 million people had signed uh, signatures, petitions to send the state of Indiana to ask that she not be executed. 
uh, Pope John Paul II got involved in the case as the governor to have mercy. And the legislators in the state of Indiana became very embarrassed when worldwide it was being let known that their law called for a 10 year old to get the death penalty. And so the legislators said, we've got to do something about it because it's embarrassing. And so they raised the age limit to 16. But they still stipulated she was executed under the old law. But the Indiana Supreme Court disagreed with that. And by a vote of 5 to 0, took her off the death row and commuted her sentence to six years in prison. Now in Indiana, you're eligible. You get parole in halftime on good behavior. So actually, a 60 year sentence is a 30 year sentence. Now, Paula Cooper has been in prison um, for, I think, over 27 years now. Um, she will, she'll get out of prison on uh, July 1st of 2013. Her and I have become friends and correspondents. After eight years, we were finally able to actually visit, although I haven't visited her since 1999 when I went to, moved to Alaska. Um, but I'm on her visitors list now. Next time I get to Indiana, we'll be seeing her. But she'll get out of prison on July 1st um, of 2013. I plan to be there to get to the prison when she gets out. I've already committed a couple weeks of my life to help her with things like teacher on the internet, what I know, which will take about three hours. But now we're going to check an account um, just, just to uh, help restore her back to society because she's, she's paid for her fine. And she knows she did something terrible. She's very remorseful. She knows it's something she can't take back. She has to live with the rest of her life. But she wants to try to contribute to society. It was brought out in trial that her father raised her very abusively. Uh, her mother and father weren't even in the courtroom today when she was sentenced to death. She was very much alone. Um, but after the fact that murder a number of people that show her love and compassion, she's responded to that today. She's a very caring person. And uh, she wants to help other young people to avoid the pitfalls that she fell into. People especially who were raised in abusive situations and say, look, I respond with violence. Look at the trouble that it got me into. Off a better way to live. And so I, you know, it's a real uh, priority of mine when she gets out, that she will live a successful life. My question is for Charity, actually. Um, pertaining to earlier when you said that the doctors had defined your son as being unrehabilitatable, uh, um, I was kind of just curious on his stance towards the Ellen Foundation, what his feelings were towards it. Does he have any type of... Um, I can't really speak as to what his stance would be on it. Um, for my, uh, I my okay. So for my own personal safety, I do not tell my son any details about my personal life. My child is incapable of feeling remorse for the fact that he attempted to rape and stab his little sister seventeen times to death. He um, he's very dangerous. So, one of the ramifications of what he did to his little sister and who he is, is that I constantly have to keep in mind what I can and cannot tell my child. I don't tell him personal details. I think he knows that I have a nonprofit foundation. He knows that I'm out and about doing my work, but in order to keep myself and those I love safe, I don't tell him anything. We talk about music. We talk about politics. We talk about, I can say anything you want to know about the local gangs. <laughs> we talk about prison culture. We talk about the latest David Foster Wallace book. But I do not divulge anything personal to my son. I gave him access to our life once, and he completely used it all to demolish it. So, I can imagine that he would not be happy about what I'm doing. The, the, the focus was supposed to be Paris. Not what? How about you that question at all? The question I um, set up to the lady who talked about not trying to read the question. Um, was there any signs prior to um, your authority incident regarding some behavior that they're, um, he had psychological issues? <laughs> um, okay, all these questions about Paris, they're also tricky because the dilemma of Paris is such a tricky one. Um, 
technically, no, there were no signs. Like hindsight's always 2020, so there's a couple of things that happened maybe in the three weeks preceding the murder that as a parent, I was like, well, that's a little off, and I took the appropriate steps. Um, like, overall, was my child, you know, the bad scene and lighting fires at an early age and torturing our kitty cats? No. In fact, I asked him why he didn't just kill a cat after he killed his little sister because he said he wanted to know what it was like to kill something. His response to me was, are you insane? I love my cat. Um, you know, there are, my son was, and still is, like I said earlier, very well behaved, extremely intelligent, very handsome, very charming, very helpful, uh, and very dangerous. Um, a week, no, three weeks before he killed his little sister, he made a joke one time about hearing voices. That was a little odd to me because his father is schizophrenic and so I asked him if he was really hearing voices and he said, no, I'm just messing with you. Well, my son didn't joke around about that kind of stuff. Of course, the first thing he did after he killed his little sister was he tried to convince the police for four months that he was crazy and hearing voices. So it all turned out to be premeditated. There was really nothing. We argued about the PlayStation. We argued about whether or not he got to play M-rated games. He didn't. We argued about, you know, I know you're a teenage boy, but bathe at least twice a week, please. <laughs> you know, little things. And then he attempted to rape and murder his little sister one night. So it all kind of just came out of the way. I thought I had as close to perfect kid as you could get for a 13 year old. For the foundation, what else can, is there a Facebook page? How can we find Oh, yeah, we're on Facebook for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Facebook is a new way, like, if you're going to do grassroots activism, you definitely have to have Facebook. Um, there's a Facebook page, there's a website now. Uh, mostly, I mean, right now, I'm just to, to the point to where I'm working on this program for the SAPD, and Jane's here, that's why I'm pointing at her. And, um, you know, I'm going to be working on book edits. I kind of have let the book fall by the wayside because life got so busy. Read still a couple pages of the book, and evidently I need to get back on point with the book. And as time goes, I'm just going to keep speaking and traveling. And, and eventually San Antonio will probably be the place that I open the first community restoration center for the homicide victim. As a mother, thank you for your strength. Thank you. <coughs> because just hearing the love you have for your son, it's just like, you know. Love is a very powerful thing, especially the love of a mother for a child. It can move mountains. <coughs> Internationally for a long time now. What are the biggest misconceptions you hear about the death penalty? Well, people say it's a deterrent, uh, which there's no credible study to ever show it's any any sort of deterrent. Uh, and also, uh, they say, well, it helps the victim's family heal. Mm -hmm. And so that's why, as a journey led by murder victim family members, we think it's important to tell our stories because the killing of another person, you know, God didn't make us that way. That, um, and so we just basically say, we've seen enough killing, don't kill for me, don't kill a my uh, Because it does not bring the closure uh, to take the families that uh, pro death uh, one point So I would say that's about it, too. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And as we travel, and especially throughout Europe and, and, uh, and now in Africa, uh, the human rights issue is so important uh, and they see the take, unnecessary taking of a life as a human rights violation which I believe it is too but in this country we don't look at the death penalty as a human rights violation but the rest of the world is looking at it as a human rights violation uh, 
how how do you expose the flaws in the way the death penalty functions? Like, how do you expose a lot of the the cons to the way they handle things about the death? Well, I mean, one of the things is the cost of the death penalty. And it's very expensive. It costs three or four times more to execute somebody who doesn't keep them in prison for a lifetime. California is trying to get on the ballot next year, and I believe California might be the next state to abolish the death penalty. They would do it by a referendum on the ballot. Um, in, in California, they've executed 13 people now. They have over 700 on death row. But the cost for each person they have executed, those 13, is $307 million. Now, California is having money problems. And so, I mean, we're going to go there and force and try to educate the people and say, look, you don't have to spend your money that way. Um, so different states have different different areas. The, the exonerated people that we just uh, were with uh, in Austin, I mean, the fact that we make mistakes when we send some people to death, most people in America don't want to see innocent people executed. And so I think it's very important what they're doing. That's why we want to be there to support them, to encourage them to get out their stories. Some of them on death row 18, 20, 22 years. They want to see the death penalty abolished. They don't want to see somebody else go through what they went through. And they were innocent. But we also are opposed to the death penalty even for people that have committed terrible crimes. You can keep somebody in prison for the rest of their life if that's what's necessary. But we don't have to kill them. And we just continue to share that word and have personal testimonies of people who have been involved with the issue. From a more clinical aspect, I've worked with a lot of people who have had loss, some really traumatic losses, and who, it seems like there was a lot of people who wanted to forgive, but I sent, I've, I see forgiveness as more of a dynamic process, whereas I'm hearing from both of you that, yes, you forgave, love overpowered, but was there times where I forgive them one day, the next day's too hard, so maybe it'll be tomorrow again? I'm just, in terms of realness. <laughs> Well, I mean, okay, so people ask me all the time if I've forgiven parents, and I try, I usually say that Bill doesn't agree with me, that I don't deal so much in forgiveness. For me, in my particular situation, like, me for trying to say I forgive my son is like saying, you know, I, I use this all the time, like the great white shark bites my leg off, and I'm like, oh, sorry, shark, I forgive you for doing what you did. In my particular <laughs> case, my son is wired, do what he does. So forgiveness hasn't really come into play. Bill says it has because I don't want to hurt him and I don't want revenge for what was done and I don't want to see him made to suffer and I've been able to, you know, through whatever process, and I, it is dynamic to, to carry these feelings out to other people. Um, was that, I mean, were there times in the beginning that I would go back and, yeah, girl, I hated my son some days. Like, I wanted to hurt, wanted to hurt, wanted to be the one to do it. But ultimately, even at the end of those days, I knew that my love was more important than the hatred that I was feeling. I mean, I tell people that I work with, feel the anger, feel the hatred, Feel the confusion, fear the disgust, feel it all. Because I'm human, I'm going to feel it anyway. But at the end of the day, when I was trying to be the best mom I can be, I had to make my decisions on love. Not out of that I want to see you hurt. And I mean, and I've taken my breaks. Where I've just looked at my son and said, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't do this with you right now. I need time to heal. Because there's been times all I wanted to do was throttle the boy. Especially since he feels no remorse. But ultimately, the, the defining characteristics of the decision should be love and forgiveness. Which Bill says I'm doing, but I don't know about <laughs> I think she may have forgiven him, just doesn't know it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I did not make a conscious decision to forgive Paul Cooper. But it's when I begged God to give me love and compassion that forgiveness happened. And then I became aware that it would happen. But I never said, okay, yeah, I'm going to forgive you. I mean, that, that was just it didn't happen. And I have not had any regrets since that day. I learned immediately the healing power that forgiveness has. Uh, it, was, it was so powerful. Um, 
that, that I knew I had done the right thing. And people said, well, what if she, what if she just thinks it's a joke? Well, that's okay. I know I did the right thing. Um, forgiveness is actually a selfish act. It's more for us. Uh, in the Bible it says forgive, forgive, forgive. That's for us. Uh, and I tell people all the time, forgiving Paul Cooper did not forgive. <coughs> than it did for Paula Cooper because it gives us the freedom to go forward. Uh, you know, a lot of people get hungry uh, the revenge uh, and, you know, that, that anger and desire for revenge can become like a cancer if you don't learn how to deal with it because we have seen it destroy not only lives of family members who have been killed, but it's destroyed the rest of the families too. And I do what I do in memory of my grandmother. And, uh, I told her story around the world. Someday be a missionary to Africa. Oh. <laughs> so I think she's smart. One last question. Cheers. So, so um, boy, they've given so much of themselves this evening, right? And I think. Yes. Um, I would interpret some of this is that it, it we've got to take this in, right? Mm -hmm. It's very powerful what you're sharing with us tonight, and, and really we thank you. It's a gift on um, what you've given this evening. So let's all thank. You. <laughs> Like, it's just a or something. It's really so funny.